everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I um, would like to call the meeting to order. Um, and I, because I've not done this necessarily before, do I need any type of motion for that, Julie? Um, nope, you can just call to order. So much. <laughs> I, know that, I know that sounds silly, but I just would like to ask. Um, if we could get a roll call, please, on everybody. Gina Cranwinkle? Present. Nader? Machine? Present. Jeffrey Gallegos? Present. Ashley Reynolds? Present. Stefana Davis? Present. Right. And we also have um, Julie Colbert, yes. Nellie Marvel, and yep. Megan Howe, who will be recording the minutes today. Awesome. I am going to do a quick share screen, if everybody will give me just one moment, so I can bring up today's discussion guide. Do we have any people from the public who are joining us today or anybody else that we, we haven't seen in the room? Um, yep, Chair Pepper is here, Bryn Hare is here, and it looks like we have four members of the public. Five members of the public. Thank you all for joining us. Well, to kick things off, um, th this is going to be an ongoing document, so some of these items you may have seen, but I would like to um, summarize uh, the public comments uh, that came in, a uh, priority review of applications, <coughs> uh, cultivation licensees allowed to sell wholesale to MMJ dispensaries and integrated licensees, and uh, with dispensaries, 25% of cannabis products uh, from social equity licensees and then the liaise of waiving of license and application fees, additional license awarded based on a demonstrated capacity to reduce cost burden of bringing additional um, employees on, immediate resentencing, resentencing and record expungement of nonviolent cannabis offenses. In addition, the CCB should join the cannabis community in asking and petitioning for the legislature to include nonviolent felonies cannabis charges available for expungement. And then in subsidies, um, the comments were with surrounding subsidized purchase of green technology, social equity, a general fund generated from cannabis sales tax and reinvested into social equity businesses, eligibility for the fund to be reviewed after three years of participation in the program, utilize um, a percent of can cannabis tax revenue to generate a cannabis workforce development program and then as the market matures, um, we will have diverse artisans and scientists available to hire, improving the market quality as a whole, similar to um, the Minority for Miracle, Medical Marijuana um, Creek Plan. Sorry, that was hard to say. So um, does everybody have that? And it'll be in your packet as well if you would like to review those on your own. So I am going to move this over to um, Gina and Jeffrey to go over the discussion guide and then we'll get started. So today, today we're going to be discussing um, who is a social equity candidate. What does that look like? You know, we're going to be also talking about, you know, what are the qualifications? Are we going to be, you know, doing this by region and disproportionate impacted areas? And how can we um, make those different uh, determinations? And in the discussion today, we'll talk about, you know, do we want to do this by income? Do we want to do this by BIPOC communities or um, opportunity zones? And this is all in our discussion today. So we will. Um, I know that last week we left off with this about thinking about creating two separate programs. Um, one program with social equity and then another program for diversity, equity, and inclusion. At this time, we're just going to solely focus on social equity and then we can come back after we make a determination about social equity and with the guidance from the Vermont Control Cannabis Board on how we, um, if we create a diversity, equity, and inclusion program as well. Any questions about that? before we move on to today's discussion. Okay, great, thank you. So 
NACB has done a comparison chart from all the social equity plans all over the different states. And we have, there has been many consensus um, for most states determined by geographical errors who have a high rate of arrest and incarceration for cannabis related crimes. Um, these they feel have been high impacted and have injury due to the war on drugs. And as we spoke about last week, we really need to have that scrutiny test again and again. You know, who has been impacted by the war on drugs? What is their injury? And that we can show that and have proof of that. Um, and that's normally how a lot of states are making their determination. And so for today's discussion, I've brought um, some reports and information um, that were gathered to really talk about how we can prove that injury and, and show that here in Vermont. Um, so according to the proposed law, Vermont age 414, they indicated the following, which a social equity needed to meet the following criteria. And it needed to have at least 51% ownership. Um, and we discussed this last week, but weren't sure. Do we want to have someone have to have prior residency in Vermont in order to become a social equity applicant? Um, in age 414, they do recommend the individual residing for at least five of the preceding 10 years in a disproportionately impacted area. Now, um, NACB is um, also in agreement with that based on what we're seeing in different states, and a lot of different states do have this criteria as well. And the major factor for that is the, you want to help the people who were currently impacted in Vermont. They're the ones who sustain the injury for Vermont. With that being said, that does not mean that we have to have a residency requirement. I really think it's up to you to really make that determination. Um, so just going from on the top of the people that I see on my screen, I have Ashley. Um, Nader, do you want, since you just raised your hand, do you want to go first? Oh, sorry, I, I wasn't sure if, um, if there was an order or anything. Uh, yeah, I, I just had a quick question. Is Are we thinking of having the five years, do they have to be consecutive or is it, could, could it be that somebody's come back and forth um, over the course of 10 years? Um, are there any thoughts on that? Yeah, so right now it's just five years. So they could have come back and forth in, in that determination. So they could have gone away for university and then have come back. Um, they might have gotten a job in a different state but came back and, and is now in Vermont. But how do you feel about that criteria either? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm still, I'm kind of mulling it over. I'm trying to weigh between the idea of trying to prevent, you know, outside multi-state organizations, um, you know, with these large box companies from coming in, but also assisting the people who may not have been here for a long time and may have only been here for two or three years. Um, so I'm just weighing that in my mind. Would you like to make a different restriction of residency requirements that they be there at least one year before 2021? Um, I mean, I was thinking we, two to three years, but um, I, I would like okay. to hear what other folks think. Um, and I'd, it, it would be good to hear what um, other states, how other states have handled this with residents who may not have been in their state for a very long time, uh, if there's any data on that. Um, and just one question before um, we move on to Jeffrey. With, how do you feel about a candidate has to have, that is, the social equity applicant has to at least own 51% of the company? Are you okay with that? Oh, I, I think that is good. Oh, great, thank you. Jeffrey? Thank you, Gina. Yes, I can answer um, 
right with what was uh with what matter just said the way that um the city of denver deals with it is uh they have a time frame from 1980 to 2010 and they say that in that time frame of 30 years the candidate must have lived in the area for 15 of those years it can be it doesn't have to be 15 years consecutively but just within this larger time frame uh, a 15 year resident is, is what denver denver colorado does Um, often also is that social equity they're dealing with limited budget so they're trying to use those funds for the people of of their state um, who sustain the injury in their state um, and I think that is often why there is this residency requirement um, Ashley your your thoughts on this yeah I, I'm torn you know I feel like of the year, I mean, that seems like a really long time, although, you know, we forget what it was like in Vermont in the 90s, um, where a lot of these things, a lot of these larger convictions were going on, a lot more trafficking was going on. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I'm torn only because, you know, that public comment specifically, I mean, Zach, I mean, he's a lawyer, he has a cannabis company, disease like you know I, I'm fully aware of, of him and his you know desires to come into the industry um, I don't know I, I think he's from Vermont I don't know how long he's lived in Vermont but I mean like those are the types of things that come to my mind as a Vermonter myself of like really making sure that there is some position put in place to require a residency but like what we discussed last week I don't want to make potentially a small pool of candidates even smaller so um, I'm, I'm a bit I'm a bit torn um, I do like what he what was mentioned in public comment about um, prioritizing certain demographics to get employed by certain retail I think that's a really great idea um, but yeah I, <laughs> I feel like I should have a more definitive answer here but I don't I'm, I'm, I'm torn based off what the applicants are um, at our disposal now I mean do we have ideas about you know who who not necessarily who is going to be eligible you know names necessarily but like do we can we start talking about sort of who on a broader sense is eligible i mean i'd like to push the dial a little bit in the conversation today on that front well i think right now that's what we're determining so i think we have to define what that means to really see what the pool of candidates would be um and is that and residency I, specifically? Like, is that like either at less well, than 100 people versus 10 people if we require it or not? Well, I do not have any of that information, and I'm not sure if the Vermont Cannabis Control Board does. Um, Julie, would you have any of that information? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed what your question was, Ashley. If we have any idea if, you know, potential pool of candidates is like 10, if we have a residency requirement, or like 100 if we don't have a residency yeah, requirement. I would say that we don't really have that data right now. Yeah. So, if I may, um, um, Gina, to put it in perspective, yeah. I just pulled up from Pew Research, and this is just to, to give, without the residency going in, but in 2018, um, Massachusetts identified 122 women, minorities, um, and of course veterans who would have gotten first crack that says when it became legal. Um, of those 122 applicants with economic empowerment priority, only 27 submitted applications to the state and eight have received a license and none as of the writing of this new article on Politico are open for business. I'll send those articles out to you guys as well with uh, the next piece with Gina. But I do think that's interesting um, just to note, especially with the, with the population size in Massachusetts. Thank you, Danica. Um, I think one of the things that we need to determine, and I think you make a really good point, Ashley, is to say we don't want our pool of candidates to get even smaller. Are you okay with a two-year suggestion as Nader um, had suggested earlier. Is two years yeah. a better? I, I, th I, think, a, I think a year. 
No, I, I think it's a year prior when to, you, I mean, are we saying like to, prior to 2021? Yeah. Like they can't establish a residency like well, right now. I mean, I mean, like we can just put one year. I don't know if we want to do 2021 or later. I know that there are hopes of um, bringing more BIPOC community to Vermont. And so if we don't make a determination of saying prior to 2021, but saying you have to have one year of residency, um, then that would allow for if people do move into the state. Um, all right, so one year, not two years. Actually, okay. Susanna, um, how do you feel about this? Yeah, I um, I also agree, and I may not have um, expressed this that well last meeting, but I, I agree that, you know, for me, it's mostly about, I want to create the minimum possible barriers so that we can manage the MSOs without excluding people at the individual level. And I don't know what is the correct answer for walking that fine line. Um, I don't think that there should be no residency requirement, but I also don't want it to be so burdensome that it shuts out too many people. And so it is it is that sweet spot. I'm afraid I don't have any good answers to offer you, but that's that's where I am on this. Well, thank you, Susanna. That I think is really helpful. Now, these are just starting points. You know, that's why we're having this conversation. Mm -hmm. So I do like the one-year requirement. Susanna, would you be in favor of that one year? Or do you want no years? How are, how are we feeling about this? Yeah, I think one year would be good. Okay, you're happy about the 51% ownership? Correct. And um, Ashley, are you okay with the 51% ownership as well? Okay, great. And Jeffrey, you have your hand up. Yes, yeah, thank you, Gina. I just wanted to um, flag one one thing for the um, for the advisory committee is that there's this trend in in litigation starting up uh, that's bringing challenges to these residency requirements under the dormant commerce clause. And there's a couple cases that have actually gone through. Um, I disagree with that position myself, but just to be aware that that sometimes residency requirements can attract a legal challenge. Just heads up. Okay, thank you so much, Jeffrey, about that. Um, it's a very good point that you raised. I'll be, yes, Danica? Uh, sorry, I also wanted to tell you I just pulled up Michigan's application and they do it a little bit differently. They ask if you've resided in one or more of the disproportionately impacted communities for at least five cumulative years of the last 10. And then they do, um, I think what may help them on the MSO front is that they require that you prove your residency as well each year. Yeah, majority of states require residency. Thank you um, for that information, Janika. I think it's helpful when we're going um, through this. Uh, the next one is at the, for 51% ownership, it would be someone who has been arrested for or convicted of um, or have had a conviction and been expunged for a cannabis offense. Are we okay with making that a social equity candidate, someone who has been arrested, convicted of a cannabis related charge? Um, I see Ashley and um, Susanna, Nader, how do you feel about that? Everybody has shaken their head yes. How do you feel? Um, I, I agree with it. I, I have one thought regarding arrests and convictions. Um, did we also want to take into consideration um, civil offenses? Because there are uh, people who receive tickets for you know hundreds of dollars um, for possession um, and you know, 200 to 300 dollars. That's that's a lot of money for some folks. And although they're not getting handcuffs put on them, um, you know, going through that process could have a disproportionate impact. Um, so, is that something we also want to consider? Um, I think that's up to the committee here. I mean, how do you how does everybody feel about that? And you know, Jeffrey would love. I know he's done extensive research into this component 
Um, how do you feel about that, Jeffrey? Um, well, I think that that's definitely relevant to measuring the impact um, that uh, thankfully some people don't have to deal with the handcuffs, but that $200, like, like Nader just said, it is an impact. And uh, there's also, um, that sounds like that would be something that would be eligible for expungement based on the Vermont law. Um, that's a thought, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that's one other thing I wanna bring up as far as this, this criteria is if there are felony offenses that are not eligible for expungement yet, um, to not limit the, uh, those people as well, um, so that someone may have a conviction or past incarceration that's not eligible for expungement as of yet, but still should should be eligible to join the industry, my feeling anyway. Um, and then if Vermont wants to uh, address that in a different way of how to make these people eligible for expungement, that's another question as well. I agree, Jeffrey, and we will be discussing expungement in a couple of sessions from now. Um, Nader, I do understand the concern about that, and I do believe that sometimes, you know, a couple of hundred dollars can, can greatly impact someone, um, but it definitely would be to a lesser degree of someone being arrested or convicted of, of, a, of a charge. Um, so I would love to hear Ashley Buzana um, how do you feel about that? You know, someone who's just gotten a ticket violation. I agree with Jeffrey. I, I kind of feel like that falls under the expungement. Um, but, you know, I think one thing I wanted to maybe um, address as well, I mean, y yes, you know, the particular person who is convicted, but do we want to include any family members? I know that obviously has to be proven, but um, is that is that something we're we're interested in, in discussing as well? Yes, that comes actually later on in this thing. It is it will be the last one of discussion, which is a family member has been convicted um, or or arrested as well. That that would and you would be eligible under that criteria. One of the things that I will show you later on is um, some research that we have found that if um, a BIPOC person um, is often at higher arrest rates and higher conviction rates um, for cannabis versus, um, according to the stats, a white person in Vermont who has often gotten a ticket um, so I can, when we discuss that portion, we might have some better information um, to provide you with. So a fuller, maybe we'll answer that component once we get to that slide. Susanna, is there anything else that you want to just mention um, before, before we move on from Nader's point? No, I think I'm, I'm on board so far. And so, um, as you just raised, Ashley, um, part B, part two of B would be if you are a member of an impacted family. So it's not just the person who was arrested, but if you're part of that family, is everybody okay with having that inclusion? Because obviously family members are highly impacted when someone is incarcerated or has a, a been arrested for these convictions. I'm assuming we're going to have a clear definition of who constitutes family. Um, we can have that discussion right now. I just, I would feel weird if it was like, yeah, my, my ex brother-in-law, one time, you know. I would say someone who, um, that person was living in, so mother, father, um, sister, brother. Um, if you can show proof of maybe a, a cousin that has lived with you forever but is a cousin but really considered more like a brother. I mean, those are elements that, you know, we really haven't taken into account. But what is yeah. your definition of family, Susanna? Well, I mean, I would say of particular um, salients here are going to be children of incarcerated persons or children in general, right? Um, and, and then and also parents spouses and siblings, right? So, 
the so-called nuclear family, I think, is an obvious first step. Um, and then, especially in communities of color, we often have multi-generational um, households where maybe a grandparent is raising children or what have you. So, you know, I would say that that makes a lot of sense. We have, um, I mean, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different laws that call family something different depending on what you're talking about, right? So like tax law, who can be your dependent? Well, you know, there's, there's, there's a rule for that. Or who's a family member when it comes to adoption protocols, right? So I would just stick with um, something that really speaks to the, the nuances of marginalized communities and the ways in which families look. Um, which includes maybe some non-traditional families. But what I don't want to see is just a whole bunch of loopholes. of just like random, you know what I mean? Because then at that point, you're not really getting at social equity, you're just getting at equity by association. Um, so we can say mother, father, or um, parental ownership. So, you know, whether that be an aunt or uncle, if that was the um, the parental figure. I mean, I'm sure that there would be proof of that, you know, if someone was in forced care or forced the family, or um, they would be able to document that, correct? Is that in Vermont? I know in other states they are able to. Okay. Um, Ashley Nader, so it's on, on this topic. So are, are we also going to have a definition of what, is, of what impact it is, or is that implied with um, the definition in B, which is an individual who's been arrested, convicted of, or adjudicated delinquent? Is that where the definition is? Yes, that's okay. the definition for June. So it's just extending it out to somebody in their family. Oh. And so for C, um, we are trying to extend this to, in, to include other people to say, we may not have an applicant who steps forward for a license, but if a licensee um, holder can employ uh, multiple social equity candidates, then that could be a type of social equity candidate. Um, so it's a minimum of hiring 10 full-time employees. Um, how do people feel about having that as, um, as like having that as a social equity candidate? if you're willing to hire 10 full-time employees who would be social equity candidates. Susanna, your thoughts? So many mixed thoughts. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that's good. I think that could be good. Um, but of course, one, you'd want to see parameters around that, right? It's like, um, you know you don't want somebody to just hire a bunch of people and then the soonest date that you're allowed to fire them you know you do that so that you could have gotten your license so we got to set parameters around that also i mean i appreciate um the numerical benefit that this can provide even though to some degree it does a little bit of tokenizing because it implies some uh morphing of, of quota um, but but at the same time underrepresented means underrepresented and so to some extent numbers are going to matter and so maybe maybe I need to get over that I don't know so we do want to say it's a, a minimum of 10 full-time employees mm -hmm. and that 51 percent of the current employees have to be social equity licensees a uh, candidate. Now, what if and then there would need to be a plan on how they were going to include them in their organization, um, and then we would obviously have to write protocol around that as well um, if we choose that as a candidate. 
And so now this wouldn't apply to smaller operations that have fewer than 10, right? Um, this is just according to the proposed law in BT 414. So we can think about if someone has smaller than 10 full-time employees, uh, but I think what they were trying to do for this um, license here was to be able to provide the most benefit of getting um, people who may not want licenses, but to get candidates and create a more diverse industry. And I, I think the minimum of 10 was to say, you know, we don't want someone who just in, in, um, has two uh, full-time employees and then they only have three or four and finding new polls on, oh, well, now they get all this benefit, so why not, you know, just bring someone else in? I think that was the determining factor here. But if you would like to discuss about something last week, we can we can discuss that as a group. What are your feelings about that? And I just wanted to, oh, sorry. Did you have any feelings about that? I know you just raised that. Did you want to make it less than 10? No, I just want to make sure that the, the committee has, has had a chance to think and talk about it, but I don't necessarily have, have strong feelings about about that. Ash Ashley, your thoughts? Uh, Jeffrey, I think you you raised this before I did. No, are you, uh, just um, on the full-time employee front, are we going to say like a full-time employee for a year? <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of fitting in the same thing as like the residency requirement. Like, okay, you can employ, you know, a, a bunch of, of people who, you know, have been affected up on the war on drugs, but how long are you going to retain them? Is there going to be you know, a clause that says they need to be employed for at least six months, or you see, you see what I'm saying? Again, um, there will be criteria for all of this. The question is, are you open to that? And then we say, you know, you need to have these people for at least five years. And um, if um, you go under that 51, you know, under 51% of employee of these candidates, then the money that you save by ha being considered a social equity would need to be returned. So that there will be criteria for anyone who's trying to do that loophole. Or we can make it 10 years, or we can say that it is the, as long as you operate, um, as long as you operate, you need to adhere to that. So um, I think that that's our criteria. Right now, it's just a generic feel are you open to um, this candidate as a whole? Is, is that something that you want to see or is that something you're opposed to? I guess without having too much to go off of based off of what the dispensary sizes are in Vermont currently, like 10 seems like a lot <laughs> of employees um, to, one, to run one operation, but um, not if it's a giant MSL. So, um, yeah, I, I don't. I really am not being very contributive today. I don't. I don't have a really great answer for this one. Well, I think that's okay. I mean, we, you know, you make important, you know, really bring up good points when you're saying, you know, most people would not be able to fit that criteria unless they're an MSO. And I think that this one is geared um, as an MSO. Is my feeling. Um, that's why Vermont put that in. So I um, thinking that this would probably affect MSOs the most. Are you okay with potentially having an MSO um, that fits that criteria? Uh, I guess I guess I would be. Yeah. And um, thank you so much. That was helpful, Ashley. I'm um, Jeffrey. Thank you, Gina. I think one uh, one important thing to consider for the advisory com committee to consider in this part of it about the uh, the hiring percentage is um, to have that hiring percentage be tethered to some kind of a profit share calculation, so that somebody can't just come in and say, "Okay, we're hiring 51% social equity candidates, but we're paying them garbage." Like we don't want to have that happen. I don't want to see that happen personally. 
Um, and so have some some kind of metric or something that if, if a business wants to participate in this program by, by creating a workforce, that it doesn't turn into what we've seen out here in California with the agricultural business of paying people out and you know doing the work of harvesting a cultivation operation and paying them below minimum wage. Um, and so that's just a, something to consider as well that makes sure that if this is a possibility that that the business owner will have to share some of the profits with the employees. Great point, Jeffrey, great point. You know, we want to make sure that they're earning, you know, a, a decent wage. Um, Ashley, I still have, see your hand raised. Um, is that from before? Do you have a new comment or question? Ashley? Okay. Um, Denisa, no, no. I saw your hand raised earlier. Um, my question was answered, thank you, but I also, in the interest of time, want to let you know that we're approaching the uh, 20 minutes remaining yeah. of the hour. I did see that. No and neither do you have um, um, any thoughts on um, the full-time employee? So, uh, when it comes to hiring employees, that's not really something that was uh, in my expertise, but when I saw that number, it I did feel like, uh, you know, hiring 10 employees right off the bat uh, would be challenging. Um, I mean, that, that, was, that was my initial thought. And then the point was also brought up of MSOs coming in and handing and, you know, creating this workforce that is derived from these um, disproportionately impacted areas. Um, so those, those were my initial thoughts. I'm not sure quite yet how I feel about the 10 full-time employees. That does seem like a lot. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my feeling on that at the moment. Okay. Thank you for that. I, I think that people really are in agreement with that 10. So we'll come back to that and see how we feel. Um, one of the things that, and obviously this other one is, you know, just saying, you know, who that would incorporate um, based on what a social equity candidate is. One of my recommendations is to have BIPOC as a group, so minorities as a group, and that's based on studies that I have recently um, been given that we can um, can see that there's a higher rate of incarceration due to cannabis. And I just want to thank Susanna and David Shear for that information um, and reports that they have found for me. And so we're going to go to the, the next slide. And on this one, this chart is from the Justice Reinvestment Initiative in Vermont that actually was um, created last year. And it does show that incarceration um, for black residents were 10% um, was double. So this is 10% for drugs, it's 5% um, for the total population. And then in this report, it was also found out that um, for um, drugs, that minorities were three or four times more frequently to be arrested compared um, to a white person in Vermont. This clearly shows to me, um, and then um, we have another race and sentencing in Vermont report that was created by Robin Weber after the 2012 Vermont Legislation um, Act of 134, and they mandated doing um, research on their justice research, you know, who was being incarcerated. And this information was taken from 2001 to 2006, and it shows when they had equal amounts of whites and minorities that um, straight means they were incarcerated completely and split meant in incarceration and probation. Um, so here we have 14, uh, 14 people um, at the same number of whites and blacks here, but they were hugely more, being a minority greatly increased your chance of actually being incarcerated. And that's what they found out from this um, report. Um, the probation seemed fine, and fines also were relatively the same. Now, 
we also have to take into account that minority is about 6% of Vermont population. So when you start thinking about this, this is really a huge percentage. And we can clearly show that, especially for cannabis and also for the war on drugs, that minorities were hugely impacted. So I would like to make a recommendation that minorities have um, are added into what a social equity candidate looks like um, based on that research. Nader, how do you feel about that? I certainly think that makes sense, I, and I agree with your recommendation. Thank you. Ashley? I agree. Well, I agree. <laughs> I support it. Thank you. That information uh, with the uh, CCB. Uh, with the uh, a consultant rather, and uh, we've been uh, slow, Kyle, to uh, to bring forward our full set of recommendations collectively. I, I should pause for a minute and and mention that I'm also a member of a broader coalition called the Cannabis Equity, uh, the uh, Can Cannabis Equity Coalition, uh, which includes Trace, uh, which also includes uh, NOFO, uh, Rural Vermont, and Vermont Growers Association. Uh, we have been chasing this thing like a mad train since uh, Act uh, since S54. Uh, we never wanted to see it cross the finish line because we anticipated that we would still be running at this pace now. I think we were correct. Uh, we were still, um, I was still looking on uh, the, the website for uh, releases of the meetings that occurred last week. Thank you for posting them. It looks like they may have gone up today, um, if not late last night. Thank you for posting them. Uh, we do understand that um, you guys are also running at the same pace, so it takes time to get these things done. Uh, I decided to come down today, um, mostly because I um, just wanted to at least show up at one of the equity uh, meetings initially. I do see that the first equity uh, meeting was posted, uh, so we'll, hopefully we'll get a chance to see that and then maybe be caught up with the other two or three meetings that have occurred as well as the other four that occurred today by the time we go into Thursday and have some more meetings. Uh, so um, again, this is at a very rapid pace uh, for all of us. I have been in conversation with Dick Sears uh, about this. Uh, we don't anticipate anybody on the executive side trying to uh, bring this to the attention of, of the ledge, uh, despite the fact we've got a lot of ledge, former ledge folks over here. Um, I expected to see David Schur as well. Uh, hey TJ, what's up? Uh, I think I saw you on there somewhere. Um, so yeah, how are you? Where are you? I'm well. Good to hear. I owe you a phone call. Um, yep. The um, so I think the long and short of what we're looking at is is that you know yeah we've sat down and we've had conversations uh, about equity uh, in a in a, in a broader conversations with the consultants. Hi Gina, good to see you again, uh, as well as um. You know, many. I should may as well shout out to Danica and 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 Jeffrey as well because you know they're going to get me if I don't say anything to them. And then of course I got to holler at Nader and then I got to holler at Susanna. Um, but the thing is, is that um, there there has been a fa very very fast paced and one of the things that we were working to that I was hoping to see was his standards uh, or principles. And those are some of the things that Julie and I have been kind of kicking back and forth as well. And Many of others have shared, Brent, I know you've been working really hard on the principles and the reason why I was hoping to see these things uh, get fleshed out is, is I hope I, I'd hope that they, they'd be out in front of these kind of discussions because I think it would kind of be able to root us and guide us into uh, these discussions, particularly surrounding equity. Um, specifically, it's um, insidious nature that it must uh, occupy in the development and rollout of this market. Um, this is this cannabis market is the first market created in Vermont uh, since the acknowledgement of the existence of and the commitment to the eradication of systemic racism. I'll say it one more time. This cannabis market is the first market created in Vermont since the acknowledgement of the existence of and the commitment to the eradication of systemic racism. For crying out loud, we just declared racism as a public health emergency in a joint resolution. 
Um, you know, I, I think uh, what it said is, is that the legislative body commits to sustained and deep work of eradicating systemic racism through the state act actively fighting racist practices and participating in the creation of a more just and more just and equitable systems. I think a few years ago, um, there there was a um, um, a statement that was made, and um, TJ, you'll probably find this familiar because I think it was you, uh, and at the time Karen. Uh, that said that uh, while slavery has been outlawed in this country for 150 years, the vestiges of it and, the Jim, Crow, and Jim Crow remain today in the form of systemic racism. Uh, despite amendments to the United States Constitution and 1866 Civil Rights Act, which were intended to promote equality and opportunity, that equality remains elusive for many people of color, both nationally as well as in Vermont. I think it was you and the Human Rights Commission executive director that wrote that and that was Act 54 2017 and that was the Attorney General's and the Human Rights Commission's task force uh, the report on all systems of state government there are racial disparities across all systems of state government that is systemic racism if it lives anywhere it must live everywhere that is the definition I think we as a state have agreed that systemic racism is actually a thing here and one of the things that what we're struggling with with this uh, process when we have a conversation about deploying a social equity program is is that you know I think we need to be mindful of the fact that we are talking about you know how do we get at starting up a market a new market alongside of an existing market because we almost we always must be mindful of the can't, the medical industry uh, we'll have to come back to that but you know, how do we start up a brand new market, take it into account that systemic racism exists? And by definition, I think it was Joe Fagan and Kimberly Ducey in the book Racist America uh, that, that basically said that this is something that, um, that we need to be mindful of from, you know, from the onset all the way through the, um, you know, not just, um, not well I'll just step back for a minute what I'm really getting at here is, is that it it's not good enough to figure out how to clear barriers to market we must build a market that is resilient to to systemic racism I, so, I hate to interrupt you Mark we've got about five minutes of left course we're out of time of course we are of course we are because we're never because we never seem to have enough and so Can I do you want to make a public comment no, no. no. Okay. You carry on. so so, and I think this whole idea of being out of time is, it kind of feeds into the very narrative that I'm talking about. Um, there's plenty of time when it comes to spending the billions of dollars that we just got in from the federal government, but there's very little time to spend in creating this market when we're trying to avoid deploying it in a systemically racist manner. So, um, I would say thank you for your time, but I'm not because I'm gonna go on because <clears throat> I came to tell you something. Uh, what I came to tell you here is, is that I think it's really important that what we're doing here is, is we're not just focusing on barriers to market entry, that we're focusing on the fact that by definition most black people are poor. Although most poor people are white, because who we are as a nation, this is how this was created. So when we start talking about how to roll out an equity program, um, you know, our comments will be around you know, we will have a broader conversation around this. We'll have more comments. Like I said, 414 is ours. Uh, you know, even the opportunity zones, it's all in there. Uh, and I, it was based upon, you know, how we understood this challenge as we were racing uh, to keep up with the pace of S54 when it was being deployed. We'll, we'll continue to, um, to add to this conversation. We appreciate the robust discussion uh, that's ongoing, uh, but I do, you know, I do believe that in every single one of these um, subgroups, I think there's maybe seven of them, that the systemic racism has to be an integral component of every single, it has to be taken into consideration. And it, it's kind of like the whole quality of life outcome, Susanna. It all, you know, it kind of has to spread across the entire uh, implementation of this um, cannabis, uh, uh, this uh, cannabis market. So I will say, um, I will say that even the executive director of 
racial equity in her enabling statute uh, is the language that says that she was brought in here to identify work uh, to eradicate systemic racism within our state government. So I'd like the Cannabis Control Board for the first time in Vermont's history to stop for a minute and pay attention to the fact that you are rolling out a market for the first time, having acknowledged the fact that systemic racism does exist, and, and having committed to the fact that you're going to do something about it. Please, let's not roll this thing out in a way that we ro we've been rolling everything else out. Let's, let's do what we said we were going to do. So thanks, thanks for the time. Um, I'll be watching you. We'll, we'll come back. We'll continue to consult to the legislature as well as to this body as well as the, um, the advisory committee to the, best that, to the best of our ability, given the pace of what it is that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Are uh, there any what, additional comments? I don't think so. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, I think we only have about a minute left. Um, I, can we just um, discuss the minutes from last meeting, if we can approve those? Do I have a motion to approve last week's minutes on Thursday? Somebody from the advisory committee? Yeah, the advisory committee. Or if there are edits. Has well, everybody reviewed or made comments about the minutes that we sent from last week's meeting? Nader? Thank you, Nader. Does anyone second it? Second. second. Thank you so much. And motion to adjourn this meeting?